<laughs> wow. Let me adjust that. Try that one again. Wow. Actually closing the porch door because it's a little cold out here. At least today it is. But even as it seems to be cold, really, what it is is warm by comparison. Because normally, I think the date is, let me see what the date is. I can't remember the date because I don't pay much attention to one day or the other. Except for my Mississippi River trip, which is on May 1st. <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah, going down the Mississippi River for four months. But today is February 21st. Huh. So, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Why is that important? It's not that important to you, maybe. But Vidivo Church is Utah's only all-outdoor church. And one of the things about being an all-outdoor church is whenever I try to record indoors... God kind of has it not work out so that I wind up going back outdoors. You see, he holds me to my words. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be pleasing in thy sight, O God. And that's one of David's cries because he knew, being a liar, just how wicked mankind could be if he was given the ability to lie, cheat, steal, and kind of do what, you know, normal politicians do. Now, I'm not trying to slam politicians. I'm just saying the office of a politician is to compromise. After all, that's what they're paid to do, to make up and take up time, money, and effort to do things that they think is right for the masses, so to speak. Now, I'll admit, maybe there's a certain amount of ethicality where people with ethics get involved in politics, but once they've been in office, even in the very first year, they seem to get into money and prestige and power. Now, Jesus did say power corrupts, so it's not surprising that we find issues with those things. So, when David cries out as a young man, May the meditations of my heart and my thoughts be pleasing in your sight. He knows where he speaks of because he realizes just how evil mankind is. Now, that's where we find ourselves in an interesting predicament nowadays. Lots of people like to say man is inherently good. Jewish culture teaches, you know, from the Torah that... Uh, well, God created and saw that it was good. God created and saw that it was good. And if we stopped at Genesis chapter 1, maybe 2, 2, because there's two kind of like things there, so, you know, you can figure that one out. But when we stop there, we're okay. But if we go on with the rest of the story, we begin to realize that um, God curses all of humanity and even creation. And we're told that all of creation groans, moans, whines even, in travail, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Now, you know, that sounds poetically pretty. It sounds wonderfully esoteric. It's kind of spiritual. It's one of those things that somebody's going to latch on to. Different cults, different churches, different religions have adapted to that in some way, thinking that they're the masters of the universe or the defenders of the earth or the friends of, and then you can put whatever you want underneath that. Anytime you hear the word friends of, you know something's up politically. Oh well, just saying. But today we don't want to talk about that coming back on our first day because kind of like your first steps is what sets up for the rest of the story. You know, like in Genesis, God starts off, in the beginning, in the beginning, God. Before four words are said, or actually I think it's less than that, because in Hebrew I think it's Barah Elohim. So, you know, or Elohim Barah. Maybe it's, I got to think about that. That's God created, but you get the picture. God 
sets the pace as he starts in the book of books called the Bible. And he pretty much identifies himself as being God. He doesn't explain it. He doesn't apologize for it. He's not apologetic about it. He doesn't have to come up with some excuse or some reason to argue about it. He just says, hey, I am. <laughs> That's it. Done. Over with. Let that be a warning to you theologians. Huh? If you're into apologetics, you're wasting your time. I'm sorry, but it's not working. Oof. What can I say? It's true. Take a look at the world around you. Apologia is just a way of getting people to intellectually stimulate themselves to be already convinced of what they're already convinced of. I mean, no offense, but when God speaks, people respond. The entire Bible is about that. So the reality of starting off on the right foot is what we do here at Video Book Church. We like to get things going in the right direction. We like to reflect on what was in order to think about what is so that we know what shall be. You know, kind of like when Jesus says, I am that I am, or you know, God speaks to Moses and says, hey, you want a name? Well, I, I've been, I am, I will be, and I ever shall be. You know, and he's kind of like saying, guess what? Whatever it is, I will be. You know, I mean, that's me. I'm God. I'm everything. I created it all. And unfortunately, we come up with the name Yahweh, Jehovah, Yahshua, Yah, no, yud heh vav -Hey, which could be, you know, if you wanted to get into the weird kind of culty kind of stuff. But really, it's just the Yud, which is a Y, the He, which is an H, the Vud, which is a V, Vav, I mean, which is a V, and an H. So that's why they came up with Yehovah. Or Jehovah, J being that, you know, in the Germans, they didn't really use Y, so they converted it to a J, which is typical of religion. But you get the idea. It wasn't about his name, it was about his being. He exists. And he doesn't explain it. And he doesn't name it. Just says, I am. Well, we confused it enough that, you know, God finally says, look, they don't get it, so I'm sending my son, and Jesus explains it to us. Except for now, they're converting what Jesus says into what, I don't know what they converted into. It scares me. So that's why we look at what was, what is, and what shall be. Because sooner or later, whether you know it or not, you're going to die. Now, you might die today. You know, the good Lord upstairs want to take you home today. But you might die tomorrow. Car accident. I mean, 90% of what people die from is car, oops, wait a minute. Now, car accidents don't kill as many people as gun violence does. I'm sure you don't want to admit that. I'm sure you don't want to, you know, have the NRA investigate that because they'll have to admit it. I'm sure you don't want to do your homework because then you'll realize, really? Seriously? It's that bad? Yeah, sorry. But, you know, there's consequences, you know, to every action, reaction, well, leaving your gun laying around, not a smart idea. You know, having easily available weaponry, not wise in these days when we just go ahead and play games to teach us how to shoot. We play, you know, outrageous, unlawful acts, you know, like stealing cars, car theft auto, or, you know, war games in order to get us ready to do what? You pissed me off? You're leaving me? My wife is divorcing me? So we pull a gun and shoot him, right? I mean, that's what America is as far as the number one cause of death, dare I say, in America. It's no longer automotive. It was for a long time, but managed to, in the last year, catch up with gun violence. Now, gun violence does include, you know, suicide by gun, you know, um, taking a gun and pointing it at an officer, which is called suicide by officer or whatever, suicide by cop, um, doing a lot of things that, you know, involve, to put it bluntly, a gun's involved. But a lot of times, because people are political about it, they want to kind of shuffle that off and make it into separate categories so that you don't look at the big picture. Well, I think Jesus had something to say about that, which is why we look at what is and what was, because people like to think that God of the Old Testament isn't the God of the New Testament, and that somehow there's a difference. Not really. So, 
Jesus saying love your enemies doesn't allow for violence and guns and those kind of things to happen for you to have the option to go ahead and shoot someone or kill them. Even Peter was told, put away your sword, man. Dude, you got the wrong idea. That's not what I said. You know, so he heals the guy, you know. That blows everybody's minds. Well, I thought he said to go buy a sword. Not exactly. <laughs> you may want to do a little more homework than that. I'm sorry, but, you know, it's just one of those little, eh, no. <laughs> sorry, it's the way it goes. But starting off on the right foot, understanding who God is, understanding where we're going, understanding that you could die, you kind of want to get a handle on this whole idea of church, religion, gospel, life, and the meaning of existence. You see, you're not created just to go out and party. I know some people think so. Man, is that some good stuff. Or some people, you know, drink so. Speaking of which, let's have a drink. Call me an addict. I got my Pepsi. Real sugar. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is we were created not for ourselves to own the world, take care of the world, and prepare and repair the world, but rather we were created for God's good pleasure. We were created in order to have what a lot of people, you know, get kind of like, you know, titillated by this idea, this word phraseology, but it's what I use in video church a lot. We were created to have intercourse. Now what that means is interaction, interreaction. Intercourse simply means the crossing of one line over another line. Now I know there are other applications of that word, and some of you have already gone down that road. Okay, well, think of it that way too, if you want to, spiritually speaking. Because, frankly, when people use the word intercourse, they don't even involve their spiritual side, do they? Otherwise, they think of it a whole different way. Because what are you intercoursing yourself with? Mm -hmm. Now, now. Don't take it wrong, but if you're out having, you know, illicit affairs, you're joining yourself spiritually to someone else. And you're carrying kind of like a piece of that with you. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, the guy that thinks he's experienced really is kind of like a multi-dimensional split personality. I mean, no wonder he has problems down the road. <laughs> Seriously. Thank God that God offers, you know, forgiveness and mercy and grace and ways to cleanse ourselves and to change ourselves and to be born again. Not of the flesh, of course, but of the spirit. So I'm kind of glad of that. You need to clean up your act. But knowing these things, God created us to have interaction, intercourse, interpersonal relationship. In other words, in the very fact that you breathe in and breathe out, the same way God wants to be there, here, with us, in us, all around us. There's a very good movie out right now, today as a matter of fact. It started, I think, Friday, which was like two days ago, because this is Sunday today, like I said, the date. Making sure some of you that keep track of me, you know, keep track of me. But it's called Risen. And, you know, with a movie like the name Risen, what do you think it's going to be about? Risen. <laughs> yeah. You know, Jesus rising from the dead. And the interesting thing is that it's a very good, very biblically accurate for some of you, you know, very um, expositionally correct for theologians. It's hermeneutic and homiletic is correct um, in rendering a accurate portrayal of what it was like when in fact, looking for and trying to identify this Jesus that rose from the dead. It starts off with the crucifixion, which is kind of interesting. But um, very good movie. I recommend everyone seeing it. It can be used for, you know, if you want to be like tools, you know, tools, toolbox, you know, having a Bible, having your, your little mini Bible and having your, you know, whatever, memorized scriptures. I don't memorize, by the way, at all. I use them, so of course they come to my mind. But when the Holy Spirit inspired Jesus to say, you have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit of God within you, he will lead you into all truth, and that you should not think ahead of time what you should say, but rather the Spirit of God will give you the words to say in that moment that you need them, meaning being brought before magistrates and judges, but also in witnessing, hello, that I don't really get into this 
kind of discipleship that people talk about when it comes to memorizing book knowledge and head knowledge. Jews did that. Guess what? When Jesus came, not ready. <laughs> no, they weren't. And I got news for a lot of evangelicals. Jesus returns, not ready. No, you're not. A lot of evangelicals today don't know what Jesus said. So if they don't know what he said, are they doing what he said? And then if they're not doing what he said, do they know Jesus? See, it's not just evangelical, but it's Protestant and Catholic and, you know, even Mormons or, you know, any other false religion or religious idea that's out there. Muslims, you know, um, Buddhists. I mean, no matter who you are, you've got some kind of image of God. Even if you're an atheist, you have your own image of yourself, you know, I mean, supposedly. But I even find that atheists believe in something that's higher than themselves. They they seem to think that that's a psychological profile. And for the flesh, okay, psychology is about mental, not about physical. So when it comes to the mind, then of course, I might agree with the psychologist that the mind has to create something to fill the void that is there because God created an emptiness for the mind to have that the vacuum has to be filled with something. So mankind puts in humanism or religion and comes up with his own intellect, truly speaking, his own ideas about God. Now, the fact that God still created him, you know, you know that's kind of like leaving out the rest of the horse, you know, with the cart or the rest of the cart with the horse because Psychologists are right, and this is something you won't hear from other Christians. Oh, that's interesting. I think my phone just kicked off. Let's see. Is God calling me? Not reading the book, but I guess God could call me on the phone, couldn't he? Oh, no, just low battery. Oh, well. But one of the things that happens with psychologists is that they get the idea right, but they come up with the wrong conclusion. They have a symptom but not the solution. That's where Christianity is psychological. It is sociological. Let's change that word Christianity to God is psychological. I guess I should shut the phone off, shouldn't I? We'll shut it all the way off so with dead battery it won't go deader. Right? Okay, let's see. Okay, then let's go push the button. Still not really smart on this whole technology junk. Because really, when it comes to high tech, while I can do it, I'm kind of a low tech kind of guy. I think that um, they're nice tools, but they get in the way sometimes. Even though I'm using a video camera to record vidivo, you know, church. So, having said all this, not only is God psychological, but he's emotional, he's devotional, he's spiritual, he's physical, he's soulful. God created us with all of these. So whenever a Christian tries to, you know, sidestep psychology, psychology, maybe Freudian psychology might be a little kind of, eh, you know, but psychology is no wrong. It's about the mind. God created the mind. So guess what? I don't mind. You know, I mean, do you mind? I don't mind. Do you mind? You know, kind of three stooges thing. But with psychology, all you have to have is the right premise predicated upon technically the intelligence of the Word of God, which comes from the wisdom of God that is manifested through the Spirit of God, as God gives us wisdom by his own divine intervention in the life of man. Man thinks he thinks of it. God says, no, I inspired him. So there you go. A lot of people like to say, well, the Bible is just um, a book of books. I'm one of them. I agree. It is just a book of books. But it's also inspired by God through men to be the word of God if and only if such be that the man himself has the same spirit that the authors have when he wrote it, being the Holy Spirit, from God, inspiring the Holy Spirit to do it because God is Father, Son, and Spirit, by way of Jesus dictating to those who were inspired to write it with its flaws, with its errors, with its contradictions, because the contradictions aren't contradictory when you look at it from the spiritual side, but they are when you look at it from the physical side. So in reality, when the authors wrote it, all, however many of them, and you know people argued about it, it was okay because God had it covered anyways because he knew in time we would have what we have in the way that it is and such as it is, that God could still be 
the Word of God, whether it's the Douay Rheims or the King James Version, that the fact is, it's the Spirit of God that makes it the Word of God to the person of God if they are seeking God, and God inspires them with that Holy Spirit to understand. Because, as we say, and everyone knows, with Medieval Church, it's the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. That's what it's all about. Now, without the Spirit of God, hey, you know, nice book. You know, it's got poetry in it. You know, it's got a lot of things in it. Psychology, sociology, government, um, laws, justice systems, history. I think I said history. It's got a lot of good stuff in there. Now, you can benefit from it mentally, intellectually, maybe even physically, but spiritually, Okay, without Spirit of God, you can't understand it. It's what it says, or God said it, and then included it in the Book of Books. So, knowing that we're created to have intercourse with God, that God exists, that God uses all these things, that everybody that contradicts it is really confirming it, and that you just have to take a bigger picture, that's why we go from what was, to what is, to what shall be. Because some people... And this is what we're talking about today, are like a crispy creme donut. They really are. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is a good donut. I don't know if you can see it, but um, unfortunately, this particular crispy creme donut doesn't look exactly like crispy creme donuts I remember, and I've seen. Because I can cook and I've done donuts, but this crispy crown, if you can see in here, it has a lot of, uh, well, let's just take it a little part, you know. It has a lot of dough in it. You know, a lot of cake dough or donut dough or bread dough, if you really want to call it such. Now, yum. The outside, the sugar, the glaze, still finger licking good. And if anybody remembers Krispy Kreme donuts, the one thing you could do, you pop it in your mouth and it about melted because there was nothing in it. There wasn't a lot of dough in it. It was fluffed up. It had a lot of yeast to cause it to go airy that when you cook them right, when you fry them right, when you bake them right, when you do however way you want to do it, what happens is that a lot of air gets inside the donut and it becomes puffed up. A lot of hot air, so to speak. And as it comes out, you got your you know, dip fats where you dip them or you smooth them or you do however you want to, to coat them. And you wind up with a nice glaze and keep it all warm. And by the time you get it, it's still pretty much a lot of hot air. There's not much dough, there's a lot of air. You could see air chambers trapped in. It's not chewy. It's more not gooey. Not gooey or chewy, but it's more kind of you get the glaze and you get a sugar rush. Boy, am I ready to teach. Don't go there. But this glazed donut it's a donut, you know, a cake donut. It's pretty much not a Krispy Kreme. It's got the name. Don't get me wrong. It's sold at the Krispy Kreme Donut House. I bought it. I told my wife that I don't want another one because when I went to the same Krispy Kreme Donut House, I bought a dozen, like most people do, and I ate probably seven of them, you know, to start with. <laughs> Finished them off in no time. She got one. And um, that's the way Krispy Kremes are. You know, just, man, you can just... You know, I mean, anybody that knows Krispy Kreme knows the original. They know what it's like. That's kind of what we're talking about today. We're talking about the original, not the imitation. Because this may look like a Krispy Kreme, it may taste like a Krispy Kreme, but I got news for you. 
When I start to chew on it, it's got a lot of dough. It's chewy. It keeps me chewing. And once the sugar's gone, I'm chewing on dough. That's not Krispy Kreme. That's donut. <laughs> so, how does that apply today? What kind of Jesus are you following? I mean, that's what I want to know. I mean, I am so being challenged by, argued with, fought with, yelled at, told I'm not loving, told I'm judging, told all kinds of things because I remind people what Jesus said. You know, love your enemies. You know, bless those who persecute you. You know, you can't yell at the president, you know, because he's an authority. You know, God put him there. Um, you know, have peace, love, and joy in not following the world in its ways. You're in the world, but not of the world. It's kind of like this Pepsi. Wow. Sugar. But it's not the original Pepsi I drank. You see, I'm a Pepsi connoisseur. connoisseur. A bottle of Pepsi is a wondrous thing. Gives me strength and lots of spring. Tastes so good, plus always strong. Lasts so little, yet cut. Costs so little, yet lasts so long. I'm sure that if you taste this drink, you sit back and really think what this drink was meant to be. Pepsi Cola for you and me. Not. You see, there's a certain amount of container here that interacts with the formula of Pepsi. Same thing with Coke, same thing with any of your drinks. Some people will say, well, I don't drink can because it's got, it's got that tinny flavor. They're sort of right. The tin chills and freezes and is cold for the use of the Pepsi to reduce carbonation dispensation, which means that you get the carbonation breaks down faster or slower depending on whatever it's in. 16 ounce returnable Pepsi bottles, wow, are delicious. Originally, can't find them anymore. Slowly but surely, you know, things have changed and bottling procedures have gone different. And I used to drink 16 ounce returnable better hop set Pepsi bottles and you could put all the different containers of Pepsi along and I could tell you what each one was because I really enjoyed it. I'm a Pepsi addict. But, um, you know, over the years they've changed and for the longest time they had this one size that was, I guess, a liter kind of, that was um, only 99 cents. You know, you still find them sort of. They changed the bottle around and match Coke. But um, it had just the right, just the right amount of carbonation, just the right amount of syrup, just the right amount of water and flavoring. And if you've ever, you know, like had to do those soda machines, you know, and adjust them, you know, just little screws, you know, and you got the syrup coming in and the little, the old ones, you know what I'm saying. There's a certain calibration to the quality of the Pepsi. Now, I'll admit, they disguised it pretty well. They stuck a whole lot of real sugar in here. And I mean a lot of real sugar. Matter of fact, just so you don't get confused, they put real sugar on the outside. See? Real sugar. Kind of like what real Christians are like. They put on the outside, I'm real, you know, because I'm a legalist. I'm real because I'm a Catholic. I'm real because I'm a Protestant. I'm real because I was in the Jesus movement. I'm real because, and they have their own reason. What's real? I mean... Reality is different than what's real. What people call real today isn't reality. Oftentimes in politics, you see that somebody will tell you, like Trump, you know, well, I'm going to do this and that. I'm going to restore this, that, and the other thing. And they get in office, they go, no, I'm not. That was just my political statement. Now I'm here, so too bad, so sad. You know, you're not going to do anything about it anyway, so who are you? You know, the voters, you can't do anything. Come on. Democracy. We the people means split them up and they can't get anything done. Just like the Senate, just like the representatives, just like government. Hey, they're all split up, you know? You're really not understanding government if you think that that works for you or with you. 
That's not the way it works. You better be praying because that's about the only thing you can do. Voting isn't going to get you anywhere. I mean, you think it will. You may think that you got something, but behind the scenes, dig a little deeper, follow the money, you'll see what happens, really. And it won't be pretty. Which is why Jesus said, hey, give them what they want. Let them go do what they want. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things be added to you. I mean, I win every election. I mean, everybody I've ever, you know, decided that I wanted in office has won because I want the one that God chooses and God chooses whom he chooses and who he puts in office is the one he chose. He may have chosen them to be a vessel of dishonor. He may have chosen them to be a vessel of honor. But either way, I win because I chose, I didn't vote because so far God hasn't let me. But I chose to support whoever it is in office. Hey, you know, if the guy's a jerk, he's a jerk. I'm supporting his jerkiness, you know. Speaking of Trump, sorry, I keep reminding me of Trump. Because Trump is a perfect example of what the people want. He personifies angry people. And there are a lot of angry people in America today. He personifies the falseness of government. Because he is false. And everybody knows him, they accept him. And he admits it. He flip-flops and does it regularly. Um, he, he personifies everything and nobody minds. They just go ahead and say, yeah, so at least he's honest about it. And that's probably why he's followed. Except for he also taps in on some evil things too, which is kind of sad about being kind of anti-Christ. So, you know, I mean, I just say that because he's an, an example. The man himself is probably fine if you just take away his money, take away his wealth, take away, you know, all the things, you know, of the world. But he typifies of how a rich man will not enter the kingdom of heaven or how hard it is because they don't get through the eye of a needle. You, you really can't get them to give up anything. I mean, they can make a token gesture. <laughs> it's my money. I'm running. But, you know, sure it is. <laughs> how much did you write off and how much will you write off? And like I said, how many times have you declared bankruptcy and how often do you know how the bankruptcy laws work so that you can write off the entire use of the monies that you can use now the fame for promotion on your next book tour or your next speaking engagement. Because power is in the popularity of the name. So, when we talk about the real thing, we're not talking about Coke or Pepsi. We're talking about reality. Reality of heavenly invading earthly. In other words, is heaven here now around us, the kingdom of heaven, about us? Is it a dimensional reality that it coexists at the same time and place? That if God would but open our eyes, give us ears to hear, give us an openness of heart, cause us to be born again, that we would be in the kingdom and of the kingdom and doing the work to the kingdom so that we would be seeking first the kingdom of God, even though we're still here in our jobs, supposedly, in our life purportedly in our families respectively and in our church hopefully i mean come on now isn't that what the kingdom of god is about bringing that with which the gospel that was proclaimed at the birth of jesus goodwill towards man i bring you glad tidings of great joy which shall be to all men behold I'm born unto you this day in the city of david a savior I think that's what the gospel is. Glad tidings of great joy. Hear the bells ringing. You know, people like to make Easter the beginning of the good news. But the great news was, boom, Jesus' inception. The day he was born, Christmas, so to speak. Although he wasn't born on Christmas. <laughs> Please, don't go there. But, you know, I mean, the great news, the glad tidings was exclaimed and proclaimed throughout the entire world by angels coming and just shouting it out to shepherds who were you know, out, in their, you know, out taking care of their sheep. Everybody else was busy getting taxed, busy doing their jobs, busy watching the stock market, or at least in the taverns, you know, doing the Roman thing, because they were proclaimed to have to go there because of their birthrights. And, you know, I mean, you're, you may have been born a Christian or, you know, you may have been born in America, so you think you've got this right to somehow being a Christian, being real about it. The reality is the good news wasn't about being Jewish or being Christian. 
The reality isn't about being a real Christian or a false Christian. The reality isn't being about political. The reality is what you can't see is more important than what you can see. I think there's a scripture in here about that. The things that are seen are made by the things that are unseen. And so the unseen is what's really going on, and the seen is just a poor imagery as looking through a glass darkly of what is reality. I mean, we know that that applies to atoms, but do you realize it applies to God and the kingdom of heaven? I mean, right now there are angels just going back and forth and who knows, maybe like some of the sci-fi channels, you know, or some of your fantasy quote, fantasy books, or maybe your, what do they call it, EW, CW, CW? I think CW, you know, where they have all these shows with, you know, hey, he's a, he's a human. No, he's a demon. Yes, he's a human. No, he's a demon. No, he's a vampire. No, he's the undead. No, he's this. He's that. Well, <laughs> you know, philosophically, scientifically, kind of, you know, like uh, Hollywood style, Okay, sort of, you know, it's almost right, but there's always kind of like this, that, and the other thing. The other thing is what claims to be real. This is what we think it is. That is what we want it to be, but the reality is what God says it is. When God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, then why are you arguing with anyone, fighting with anyone, posting things about people, saying things, doing things, and acting like, you know, the antithesis. Antithesis Antithesis means the opposite of what we're told. It means like, okay, if God says go right, you go left. It means like if you, it's kind of like a Greek, you know, thought where you're just like duality. Now, duality isn't what God is, but duality is how man thinks. He just thinks in linear thought. He doesn't think in spatial reasoning or we would say quantum physics, quantum reality, quantum religion. I teach a perspective of, of uh, integral specificity that is quantum reality. I mean, seriously, it, because it incorporates all from God's perspective to ours, not from our perspective to God. Systematic theology looks at it from man's point of view, looking at God. I look at it from God's point of view, looking at man. <laughs> So I call it integral specificity because the integrity of the specifics are the details with which God has created all of us. So, you know, quantum reality. QR. <laughs> Somebody, some, some, some techie somewhere is going to go, QR, I heard that. <laughs> now, it means something different in tech world. But, even as I keep trying to chew on this, when I hear people tell me about Jesus, I go, I chew on it. I think about it. You know, blonde hair, blue eyes, that's what I grew up with. You know, the Catholics had the blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. Some of them had this, you know, flaming heart with this, you know, symbol thing and all the weird stuff, you know. I wouldn't raise any religion, so I didn't know what they were talking about. But when I got saved, you know, I kind of, Looked into movies, you know, and King of Kings, you know, like, blonde hair. He was a surfer. Wow. Smoke pot, right? I mean, that's what the pot people will tell you. <laughs> Jesus smoked pot. He believed in natural. Pot isn't natural. Sorry. Don't go there. But, you know, I listen to people today even talk about Jesus. You know, like, tell me he's the son of God. I go, oh, yeah, okay. And he sent a man. I go, yeah, okay. You know. They tell me that, you know, he's God. I go, okay. And he's, you know, part of the Trinity. I go, okay. You know, try you, try Trinity, any way you want to call it. You know, you can still come up with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'm okay with it. But then they go and they do something that shows, do you know it here and don't do it here? What are you doing? So I chew on it. Some people I chew on because I kind of ask them, well, why are you doing that? Well, because, you know, we have to stand up for right and goodness and righteousness. Because if we don't stand up, if good men don't say something or do something, then, you know, evil will flourish. I said, does that say that in the Bible? It should. It does, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. You see, that's where we're getting into reality check as opposed to real Christians 
kind of fluffing stuff, or in this case, chewy, gooey, maybe even imitation coffee that's gone cold, <laughs> and the Word of God. You see, I could read the Bible and I could come up with anything I want to do is in here. Really. Anything I want to do is in here. If I want to kill, it's in here. If I want to murder, it's in here. If I want to commit adultery, it's in here. If I want to fornicate, you know, stipulate, designate, alienate, you know, <laughs> create, you know, it's in here. It's all in here. What it says, though, is a little different, but it is in here. So, how it comes from in here, out, it's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of God. And supposedly, the office of teachers, preachers, prophets, pastors, elders, deacons, who knows? You know, anybody that has a nose, you know, so to speak, you're Jewish. But no, I mean, anybody that, you know, you know, halfway, you know, readable should be teachable to be able to see it and just repeat it. I mean, that's all it really takes. Just repeat whatever's in here and you got it, you know, if you did the whole thing. But you see, when I said it's in here, everything, I mean, from quantum physics to whatever you want to call it, it's not only about that, because if I take that little piece out, it's like tearing a piece off. It's like taking this donut and going, you know, if I just tear the, matter of fact, let me do that right. If I just tear off, have you ever seen anybody do this? Don't you hate it? But just tear off, you know, the outside of the donut. You know, I really get the part I like. You know, sugar and sweet and really neat. Yum, dum. <laughs> Can I say that again? Yum, dum. But, you know, it works. It came from the donut. It's a part of the donut. Looks like the donut. Tastes like the donut. But, uh, what do you do with the leftovers? Kind of like prosperity doctrine, you know, good news without the rest of the story. Bible from Holy New Testament. Hearing Jesus but not doing what he says. It's kind of like, you know, taking your own little part and only eating what you like. I don't know about you, but I was told that... Ooh, look, ants. <laughs> it's too cold for them right now. I was told that you had to eat the whole thing. Speaking of which, sticky too. And I guess that's the problem with taking what you want out of the Bible and only getting what you like. It gets a little sticky once you start talking to God about it. it gets to be kind of like, uh, oh, I forgot about that part. Or I didn't pay attention to that part. Or I didn't know that was in there. Yeah, you did. Because we're told that from the volume of the book, it's written of Jesus. Jesus had a lot to say. Jesus had a lot to preach. Jesus had a lot to teach. Jesus had a lot to challenge. Jesus had a lot to state. Jesus, in fact, made a criteria so strict that no one could fulfill it, but we could follow along to see if he would help us to do it. Because that's the only way, really, that we wind up with grace is because we try. We go about our life living what Jesus said, not what necessarily he did by dying on the cross. Yes, you might. <laughs> if you're going into the Great Tribulation, you're going to die. And you'll probably be, maybe not crucified, but you're going to probably get your head cut off for your faith, unless you take the mark and then you don't have to worry about it. But what Jesus told us to do was to have a relationship with his Father. Now, people will talk about Jesus and they'll do their thing. People will argue about Jesus, and they'll argue about that. It's a little hard to argue with 
God the Father, the creator of us all. You see, Jesus said that he prayed for his disciples that they would know him, yes. And they, they got to know quite a bit about him. The book, uh, the movie Risen shows just how little, really, that they understood about Jesus completely. And that even after the Holy Spirit was upon them, they didn't know everything. You know, they weren't perfect in their knowledge. They were still learning. And so they even exemplify that by stating, hey, we're still learning. And that's what's been going on for 2,000 years and will be going on throughout eternity, still learning about Jesus. A lot. But the more you learn, the less you know, the less you know, the better you learn. Seriously. Because you learn, once you know enough, to trust more, to think less. If God says, Jesus, you don't even ask anymore. You just go, okay. Go walk on water. All right. You know, if you, you know, you fall down through the water or the ice or whatever. See, I can walk on water anytime I want to. I just go on the ice. But most people don't think of that. I'm one of those kind of, huh, let me think about it first. And I come up with a way to do it. And then Jesus goes and, you know, brings out the sunshine and, you know, I fall through the ice. I was like, okay, Lord, I get the picture. You know, I would be in a little bit, you know, like maybe too thoughtful. Or maybe I'm pretty good at what I think about. But using that kind of logic, God knows that. So he's already answered my questions beyond what I can comprehend, beyond what I understand, beyond what I know, which is why I follow him. Because loving your enemies makes no sense at all. But Lord, what about the guy that breaks into my house, you know, and steals my children, rapes my wife, burns down my building, you know, and then laughs at me? You're telling me to love him? Do you get the picture? I hear that more often than anything else. Well. And I mean, let me clarify something. I hear that from Christians more often than anything else. Now, you would think Christians, you know, real Christians. Would know the truth. You would think real Christians would live the truth. You would think real Christians would be like Krispy Kreme donuts, you know, you can eat a dozen of them, you know, and just ah, have a sugar rush. But I get asked by Christians, well, what if somebody breaks into your house? You know, like, wasn't there a woman? Does anybody remember this? You know, I mean, in the news, you know, she was reading a book, not the Bible, but she had her Bible too, but she was reading a book, an extra book, called The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. She was trying to live it, you know, and she said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm messed up, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not somebody that, that, um, you know, can follow this. I'm just trying to do the best I can, but I do believe that I'm here for a purpose. And she was saying that to a man who had just broken out of a courthouse, shot the guard, killed the guard, broke away, escaped, went down the road, found her, abducted her, took her car, took her, went to her house, had her tied up, and would have killed her. So she starts talking to him. She actually winds up witnessing to him. She gets Susan Smith, if I remember her name right, she gets him finally the next day to turn himself in because even going to suffer the consequences for his actions he begins to realize there's a purpose for his life. Even if he has to suffer now, there's still eternity yet to come. Now, I don't know what his final results were, but I know what hers were. She should have died. She didn't. So when people tell me what happens if, I like to say, what aren't you paying attention to? Did you not hear me? Like God says to most people, did you not hear what I said? Do I have to spell it out? Love your enemies. So people say, well, that doesn't mean, and they'll go on. I say, well, read the next line. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. You know, and you just go on and on reading what Jesus says. And if you get to the end of that teaching, he says, these people that do these things, not adapt them, not interpret them, not rearrange them, not say, well, you know, because he said it also be perfect, you can't do that, so, you know, you really can't love your enemies, you know. Well, I think he said do these things at the end when he was summing it all up. He says, well, blessed are you if you do these things. You'll be like a man whose house was built upon a rock, not sand. 
So, whenever Christians ask me, you really mean, you know, like, love your enemies? I just ask them, well, what do you think the church did for the first 300 years before it got involved in politics and religion? What did Jewish believers do for the first 300 years? And then the Gentiles, so excited about finding something called the Holy Spirit, what do you think they did for 300 years? Because recorded history does record the early Christians accurately, factually, and naturally. They were so frustrating to Roman emperors, so aggravating to local government, so mind-blowing to the average person, everyone wanted to know what makes you different. How come you don't argue with the government and you put up with these Roman emperors? How come you allow yourself to go to the, dare I say, Colosseum to be crucified, set on fire, torn to pieces by lions, and you think it's an honor and a privilege? Why do you think that you can inherit eternal life when you can't see it? And somehow you think that this man who rose from the dead is going to save you from dying and you're out of your mind letting your wife die or your kid die or those around you and you don't seem to mind. You know, the church minded, but they just said, well, you know, whether I live or whether I die, I live unto God or I die unto God. But it's God who decides, not you. And so, when I hear that from real Christians, I have to tell myself, I'm not a real Christian. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a real Christian. I'm not a Krispy Kreme donut, you know. I'm just me. I don't know everything. Matter of fact, I know all the answers to people who think they know everything because I'm pretty good at figuring those out. Those are all stupid to me. I'm pretty good at figuring out what's false, you know, because frankly, I've tried them all, you know, mostly, and they're all pretty easy to see through. But the thing I can't get a handle on, I can't grasp, I can't do anything but do it, is love. I, I can't answer you the reality of trying to change Jesus. I don't know what you're going to do about it. Because even Jesus said, look, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Will Jesus, coming back to the world, after telling all his disciples, do these things I've said to you to do, and you will receive everything. You know, you'll be co-heirs with me. You'll be called children of the Most High God. You'll be the sons of God. You'll have peace in this life. You'll have joy in this life. You'll have happiness. You'll have exceeding abundance so that you can spread it around. You can be a socialist. Yes, Jesus was a socialist, so to speak. He wasn't all about, you know, build a business, you know, and make some money for yourself, you know, and have, have a vocation so that, you know, you can work hard, you know, and make yourself into, you know, like some pride and self-ego and, you know, self-accomplishments. Yeah, selfish. Uh -huh. So it's not humanism about socialism or about communism or about democracy, but rather it's theocracy following Jesus, what he said to do. My life is not my own. I've been purchased with a price. My politic is not, I'm an American citizen, so I have to vote. Frankly, that's just a privilege, and I don't want to vote because I'd rather pray. Um, whatever divides us separates us from God, really, because God wants us to love our enemies. And God knows he did say, love your brethren, and love those others too and you know hate the world but you know love the sinner hate the sin but love the sinner and that doesn't mean you know like you cast off you know homosexuals and atheists and you know anybody else and just say go away you know, don't be a part of my life i think a leper you know is probably the worst thing that you could possibly imagine in jesus day and he'd hug a leper do you have a problem with you know a pedophile really seriously them too? What do you think he meant when he said, follow me? What do you think, if I could just put it bluntly, a Christian is? 
What do you think a follower of Jesus is? What do you think he meant when Jesus said, Do you love me? I don't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. I'll admit that. It's true. I miss, you know, the kind of Pepsis I used to have, so I have to put up with real sugar. It's kind of a bummer that I can't get the Krispy Kreme donuts that, oh, I know that what they were like, but they've changed the recipe. You know, maybe some of them still do it the right way, which I know if I go to a different Krispy Kreme or maybe a different time of day, maybe they'll produce one. Not all of them, but one or two. I know that, you know, if I look around, I'll find people who know what Jesus said. But the real question I have to ask myself is, am I in the faith? Am I doing what Jesus said? Because, you know, people will argue with me a lot and say, you're not loving. And I'll go, really? What part of not loving are you talking about? Well, you're telling me that Jesus said this, and I don't think that's very loving. Did you ask him? That's all I ask. Did you ask him? Because Jesus said, oh, ask me. If any man like wisdom, let him ask of God, or bring it down, because talking literally. James 1, 5. Well, no, I didn't ask him. I'd have to believe that he exists. And you're a Christian, right? Well, yeah. Well, do you talk to God? Well, yeah. But when do you hear from him? Well, when I'm worshiping, you know, I get this warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, inside. I get this ecstatic dancing feeling. I get this rolling around on the ground feeling. I get this like, ooh, God wants me prosperous feeling. Ooh, God wants me to have an abundant life feeling. You know, I get all these things, or I read a daily light, you know, which, believe me, there's nothing wrong with reading a devotion. When you pick and choose what fits, yeah, you know, kind of wonder about it. So when we talk about the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God and the son of God, Jesus, it really isn't just that. Because now we're going to get where the rubber meets the road. We're going to put the hand to the hand. We're going to put our hands to the plow and see if we can make a furrow in a straight line. Maybe you can get my message after all that, or maybe you can't. But what we're going to do is get personal. Seriously. That personal. Your secret sins, and you got them, are known by God. You probably do them, excuse them, and use them. If you're like most Christians, you know, you feel guilty on a Sunday, remorseful on a Monday, bad about it on Tuesday. And by Wednesday, you're kind of like, you know, over it. And thank God that you go to church on Wednesday, if you do, because then you kind of feel bad about it again. But David said, you know my secret sins. And he admitted them. You don't have to admit them to me. And you don't have to tell the church or some priest or anyone else. But you do have to deal with it. You know, you have to deal with God every day. And that's what's personal. That's what God is about. That's what supposedly being born again meant. It's not about being personally accountable to your church. Sorry. That's just a playground to practice. The reality, not the real Coke, the real Pepsi, the real Christian, but the reality of the kingdom of heaven about you, the kingdom of God within you, the kingdom of God here right now is there's a king in the kingdom. There's a God in the heavens. There's a reality of heaven on earth right now where you are where I am right here right now and that reality means that you got to deal with it you have to put up or shut it you have to demonstrate by being remonstrated or remonstrated by God telling you something and you doing what he tells you to do. That's what it boils down to. Seriously. Might be as simple as, you know, hey, go to church on Sunday. I don't know. You know, maybe for you that's an issue, and so you gotta go. Maybe it's, you know, 
It sounds like one of those hucksters on television, but maybe it's to watch Video Church and send me $10. No. We don't take any money ever, anywhere, anytime, anyplace. So you can't give us anything. So no offense. We're here to give, not get. So you can't give us anything. So don't get, don't go there. But seriously, what is it that God is telling you to do today? I mean, the joy of the Risen movie was just to be able to see one Christian on there that was like, that's what a Christian is. He was a kick in the head. He was funny. He reminded me of me in the old days. Maybe I'm not the real Christian anymore. Maybe I'm not the reality of what I was, but what I am. And maybe, maybe it's only at certain times I'm more I'm trying to come up with something. The kooky cookie. You know. The kooky cookie. That's a good one. The kooky cookie that I used to be. You know, man, blessed out of my socks, you know, just growing and flowing and showing and knowing the love of God and sharing it everywhere I go that I'm just so amazed that God can be in the reality of my life that I'm so blessed that I smile from ear to ear that I can't help but hear what he has to say, see what he's doing and be amazed that God chose somebody like me because after all, I'm not worthy of being saved, but I am and so such that I am is what I'm able to give to God and I'm thankful that I can be so in reality of touching the word of God that it's alive and well and living in me and that I demonstrate it every day of my life as I'm raving and breathing and achieving all the things that God wanted me to do in my life as I was created by him for him and to him and me and God the glory for him and ever again. <laughs> oh, that was me. <laughs> and you know, that is me. Who are you? Do you know? Jesus was. Jesus died. But Jesus isn't going to stop you from going to hell. You know, I don't often get a chance to throw hell in. Why not? It's a hell of a question, but no. Nobody's going to stop you from going to hell. You're the one that's taking yourself there. That's how it works. It's just like, you know, following real church, living real Christianity, living real theology, having real, you know, Calvary distinctives. Now, none of that's Reality. Reality is what you do, not what you read, said, heard, believe, think, hope for, or achieve. It's what you do today. Today, as it says in the provocation, if you hear his voice, no, today, hear his voice. Because you run out of time. You don't have any time left. Come on, Jesus is coming sooner than you think. But the reality is, what do you do? I mean, as soon as this video church service is over and the video is off what do you do do you think about it do you talk about it do you wonder about it do you go i remember those crispy crumbs <laughs> and you go they don't taste the same or twinkies now twinkies are not the same they're spun they used to be light and fluffy spongy but now they're just spongy gummy you know because the original is gone somebody else has taken over so, really, what are you doing? Are you settling for less or becoming more? Are you achieving all that God wants for you, that is proud of you, that wants to blow your mind with, that wants to be involved in your life and have intercourse daily with? Or are you just one of those, you know, real Christians. <laughs>